Uh, yes, I'm going to be speaking about real face-to-face -face, uh, networks, the kind we humans have been making for tens of thousands of years. Because we humans are embedded in these networks. And these networks obey very particular mathematical, biological, psychological, and sociological rules. And understanding these rules gives us whole new ways we can intervene in the world to make it better. We can use our understanding of social network structure and function for good to intervene in both online and offline networks to improve our health, our wealth, our security, and our civic life. And in the broadest sense, taking the embeddedness of human beings within networks seriously shifts the focus of our gaze away from the targets of our interventions to everyone else around the targets. So what I'm interested in is, is not the response to treatment among the treated. I'm interested in the response to treatment among the untreated. I want to know what does everyone else do when I give you an intervention of some kind? How does the world around you change when I deliver a medicine or a product or an idea to you? Now, this is the kind of real social networks we make. Every dot is a person. Every line between them represents a relationship between two people. Who's whose friend, whose neighbor, whose coworker, whose spouse or sibling, for example. And to my eye, these networks are intricate things of beauty. And they are so elaborate and so complex and so ubiquitous, in fact, that one has to wonder what purpose do they serve? I mean, why are we embedded in networks? How do they form? How do they work? And how do they affect us? And I've spent nearly 20 years studying how and why human beings form social networks and how they affect our lives, how they affect our health, our desires, our feelings, our thoughts, and our actions. Now, part of this work has, in, has involved exploring the evolutionary basis, the genetics of human social interactions. And one of the things to understand about networks is that social networks afford individuals different structural locations within the network. So a network has a topology, an architecture, a pattern of ties, and different ones of us occupy different structural positions within this network. And this slide shows three of the most basic mathematical ways you can summarize people's positions within a network. So there are four nodes that are highlighted here. Node, uh, if you look at node B in the upper left and node D on the far right, you can see that the difference between these two nodes is that they have a different number of connections. Node B has four friends. Uh, D has six friends. This is something people know about themselves. You have 10 friends. You have eight friends. I have no friends. People know this about themselves. This is known as the degree of a node, or the number of connections it has. But we can also see that there are actually other ways we can summarize the position of a person within a graph. For example, if you look at nodes C and D, both of them have six connections. But we, with this bird's eye view of this network, can see that C and D are rather different. And I can cultivate this intuition in you by asking you, who would you rather be if a deadly germ was spreading through the network, C or D? D. You have the intuition that D is going to be less likely to get whatever's spreading and less likely to get it early in the course of the epidemic. Conversely, who would you rather be if a juicy piece of gossip were spreading through the network? C. You have the impression that C is going to get whatever's spreading sooner. This is known as the centrality of a node. It's different than the degree of a node, and it can be quantified mathematically in a variety of ways. Finally, look at nodes A and B. A and B both have four connections, but there's a difference between the two. And the difference is that the friend of a friend of B's is not a friend of B's, whereas the friend of a friend of A's is back again a friend of A's. A, uh, A's friends are friends with each other. This is known as the transitivity of a node, and it can also be quantified in a variety of ways. In one of our first studies of the genomics, or the evolutionary biology of these uh, processes of, so, of friendship and the structure of human social interactions, we published this paper where we look at those three quantities, and on the, on the x-axis is the three quantities, and on the y-axis is the percent of the variance explained or the heritability, and on the far left in the red line, we found that 46% of the variation in how many friends you have can be explained by your genes. Now, this is not a very surprising result. What I just told you is that some people are born shy and some people are born gregarious. People vary in their taste for friendship. But in addition, we found that those other higher order properties of where you are in the network can also depend on your genes. So in the next line over, in the orange line, we found that 47% of the variation in your transitivity can be explained by your genes. This is a very bizarre result. What I've just told you is that if you have Tom, Dick, and Harry in a room, 
Whether Dick is friends with Harry depends not just on Dick's genes or on Harry's genes, but on Tom's genes. Whether you two are friends with each other depends on her genes. How can that be? We think that people vary in their tendency to introduce their friends to each other. Some people knit the networks around them together, and some people in sort of world's collide theory keep their friends apart. And finally, even 29% of the variation in how central you are in the network can also be, uh, be explained by your genes. So the fundamental reality of our desire for connection and our susceptibility to social influence, it turns out, has always been with us. And where you are in this vast fabric of humanity depends in part on your genes. And my lab has been amassing evidence that it is indeed not a coincidence that we form social networks with very particular mathematical properties, that natural selection and evolution has shaped not only our individual taste for friendship, but the social organization, the way we organize ourselves into networks. And actually, all of modern invention, whether it's telecommunications or the internet, or all the engineering that goes into it, is overlaid onto this fundamental mathematical structure, which well precedes all of those inventions. So we've shown that there's an evolutionary significance to and heritability of social network structure and function, and that phenomena like peer influence and homophily, which is the love of like, the fact that people hang out with people they resemble, have very ancient and fundamental significance. So the way I summarize this part of our work is that across evolutionary time, it must be the case that the benefits of a connected life have outweighed the costs. Now, if it's the case that our social structure is somehow written in our genes, it suggested to us that if we could go back 10,000 years and map the social networks of the people that lived during the Pleistocene, their networks perhaps should look like ours. Now, of course, we couldn't do that, so instead we hit upon the idea of mapping the social networks of a group of people that lived like we did during the Pleistocene, specifically the, the Hadza, I was just asked to update my JavaScript, um, specifically, the Hadza hunter-gatherers of Tanzania. So there are only about a 1,000 of these people left. They hunt and they gather for their food. They live around Lake Ayasi in Tanzania. They sleep out under the stars. They have no material possessions to speak of. After, after six weeks in one region, they move to another part of the, the region, and they keep moving from place to place every six weeks or so. They form these mobile camps. They have sort of fluid social relationships. And what we did is, is we created a photographic census of all living adult Hadza. As I said, there are only about 1,000 of them. And we printed them on posters, like a kind of Hadza Facebook. And we took them into the field. And there's my uh, uh, postdoc, Karen Apicella, in the lower right. And you, you can't make an appointment with a Hadza person. They, they don't have a phone. I mean, you, there's no way to schedule anything. So Karen would just sit around like Ayasi and wait. And like a week would go by, and someone would walk. And she'd excuse me, who are your friends? and they would identify their friends, and then they would leave, and then she'd wait another week, and another person would walk by, and she'd do the same thing again. And so we very painstakingly collected social network data about the Hadza hunter-gatherers. And to make the very long story short, their networks look just like ours. Visually and mathematically, with everything we could throw at them, the social network structure of the Hadza hunter-gatherers are just like ours. So despite the fact that in the intervening 10,000 years, we've invented agriculture, we've invented cities, we've invented telecommunications, the structure of our social networks is indistinguishable from this population that lives like we did during the Pleistocene, consistent with our evidence that I showed you a moment ago about how it's written or it's par has a partially genetic basis. Now, in a parallel stream of work, also over the last 10 or 15 years, using both observational and experimental methods, we and others have provided evidence that a variety of behaviors and phenomena beyond germs spread within our networks via processes of social contagion, or what we call induction, beyond just dyadic ties. So it's not just that I give a germ to you and you give it to him. I gain weight, it makes you gain weight. You gain weight, it makes him gain weight. I buy a product, it makes you buy a product. You buy a product, it makes him buy a product. He buys a product, it makes her buy a product. A kind of spreading process through the network. And we've shown this for things like obesity, smoking, drinking, and drug use behavior, for emotional states like happiness, loneliness, depression, and also altruistic behavior. I'll show you a bit of that in a moment. And others have shown this for criminal behavior, voting behavior, purchasing behavior, and ideas. People's attitudes, decisions, and behaviors depend in quantifiable ways on the attitudes, decisions, and behaviors of others to whom we are both directly and indirectly connected. 
such that up to three degrees of separation, it's not just what your friends are doing, but what your friends' friends and your friends' friends' friends even are doing that has a discernible impact on your own uh, behaviors and attitudes. Now, of course, there's a lot more going on here than just this type of induction or a kind of social contagion shown in the far left. So for instance, you might gain weight, it makes me gain weight, like a kind of social domino effect that makes you gain weight and you pass it forward within the network. That's one possibility. The second possibility is not that your weight gain caused my weight gain, but rather that you and I formed an attachment because we have a similar body size or similar interest in food or similar taste for exercise to begin with. This is what's known as homophily or birds of a feather flock together or love of like. And the third possibility is that it's not that your weight gain causes my weight gain, nor that we formed a connection because we were similar, but rather that we share an exposure to something like a gym that makes us both lose weight, or a fast food joint that makes us both gain weight at the same time. Now typically, all three of these processes are present in any social phenomenon. Why are your customers buying iPhones? Are they buying iPhones because their friends are buying iPhones? Do the technophilic, Apple-loving consumers preferentially form friendships with each other? Or is Apple's marketing campaign especially effective? Why are your children doing well in school? Are they doing well in school because their friends are doing well in school? Do the nerdy children preferentially hang out together? Or do they have a charismatic teacher that's making them all perform at the same time? So a variety of econometric and experimental methods are required to disarticulate the extent to which each of these processes are present. And we've invented some such methods and applied other methods in a variety of domains. For the rest of the talk, now I just summarized 15 years worth of work in like five minutes. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna to shift to some of the work we've been doing more recently, focused very much on our experiments. This is one of the first experiments we published a few years ago. It's a kind of a behavioral economics experiment. In this experiment, college students were brought into a laboratory. They were strangers with each other, and they were randomly assigned into groups of four people. And, and what they were told is, is they had to play a public goods game. They were each given some money, we told them correctly that if they gave money to the group, we would double the money and it would be divided amongst their group members. So if I gave a dollar, it would become two dollars divided amongst the four people. Each would get 50 cents. I'd also get back 50 cents, but I've paid a dollar and I only get back 50 cents, but the group has benefited more than the dollar that I gave. Now, the rational thing to do for any individual, of course, is to defect and not contribute, hope that everyone else contributes, and then I'll get a benefit without paying a price. Of course, if everyone does that, the commons collapses, the group collapses. Uh, and the best is if everyone contributes maximally, then the group fares extremely well. Now, what we were interested in is not another deep, old, and hard problem, which is the evolution of cooperation and of reciprocity. That is to say, if I'm kind to you, why do you reciprocate the kindness? Nor were we interested in indirect reciprocity. If I'm kind to you, will she be kind to me? Maybe to reward me for my kindness, or maybe because she thinks, oh, he's a kind kind of guy. No, we were interested in, if I'm kind to you, are you kind to him? Could we find experimental evidence of social contagion here, which could not be due to homophily or to contextual factors? Because what happened in this experiment is that after the first round of the game, a bell would ring, and people would be assigned to new contacts, and then a bell would ring, and they'd be assigned to new contacts, and so forth and so on, for multiple rounds of the game, thus allowing us to create artificial linear networks which we could study. And what we found in this experiment is that if Eleni is kind to Lucas in period one, Lucas is kind to Erica in period two, Erica is kind to Jay in period three, and Jay is kind to Brecken in period four, and this goes to three degrees of separation. And this is one of the more, another bizarre result to come out of my lab in the last few years, because what I've just told you is that how Jay treats Brecken depends on how Eleni treated Lucas, even though neither Jay nor Brecken ever saw or interacted with Eleni or Lucas. How you two people treat each other depends on how those two people treat each other, even though you don't know who they are. Here shown experimentally a kind of spreading process in the network. And this geodesic, through the network spread, highlighted in red, is distinct from the temporal persistence highlighted in yellow, such that if Eleni is kind to Lucas, Lucas learns to be kind. And he's kind to Erica in period two, and Lysander in period three, and Bemi in period four, and so forth and so on. In fact, if you fold back all the extra kindness that accrues, for every extra dollar that Eleni gives Lucas, the network functions as a kind of matching grant, doubling the downstream benefit. So pay it forward is real. And in fact, one of the fundamental uh, functions of human social networks, if I may say so, is that they function as a kind of social magnifying glass. 
Networks magnify whatever they are seeded with. If you put something in a network, it will make more of it, whatever it is. Alas, networks are agnostic. They don't care. So networks will magnify fascism and Ebola and violence and fake news and hatred. But equally, they will magnify love and kindness and, uh, and uh, happiness and ideas. But they must be seeded. You have to get the epidemic going before it kicks off. Now, to be clear, we're affected in another way by social networks. It's not just what's happening around us, whether people are gaining or losing weight or, or starting or quitting smoking or buying a product or something. The actual structure of the network also matters. So think about these two objects. We all studied them in high school chemistry. On the left, you have graphite, and on the right, you have diamond. And the difference between the two relates to the structure of the carbon atoms. If you take the same carbon atoms and connect them one way, you get graphite, which is soft and dark. Or you take the carbon atoms and connect them a different way, you get diamond, which is hard and clear. And there are two key intellectual ideas here. First of all, these properties of softness and darkness and hardness and clearness are not properties of the carbon atoms. They're properties of the collection of carbon atoms. And second, which properties you get depends on how you connect the carbon atoms to each other. Connect them one way, you get one set of properties. Take the same carbon atoms and connect them a different way, you get a different set of properties. And it's the same with human social groups. You can take a group of people and connect them one way, and they're very kind to each other, and they, adopt, and they start to smoke, or they quit smoking, or they spread fake news. Or you take the same people and you connect them a different way, and they have none of those properties. So these properties are emergent properties that arise because of the existence of the group and the pattern of connections. They're not solely or necessarily properties of the individuals themselves. New properties can, and this explains, in fact, how it is that the ties between people can make the whole greater than the sum of its parts. New properties can emerge, properties such as cooperation and violence, health and happiness, coordination and innovation, because of the connections, because of the ties between people, and not necessarily because of the people themselves. So our experience of the world also depends on the actual structure of the networks near and far. Now, beginning about five years ago, we began to ask ourselves what we call our so what question. We had spent about 15 years understanding the origins and functions, uh, the origins and performance and the structure and the function of human social networks. I've only shown you a tiny fraction of the work we've done. But about five or seven years ago, we began to ask what we call our so what question. So what if we understand social networks? What can we do with that knowledge to make the world better? And we began a program of research, I'm going to give you some highlights now, that illustrate some topics that I think will be of interest to people in this audience. There are three broad ways you can intervene in social networks to make the world better. The first is you can manipulate connection or change the structure of the network. Here what you're interested in is the wiring diagram. Who is connected to who? Kind of like the carbon example I just gave. So you can take these people and you connect them in one pattern or you connect them in a different pattern. That's a way you can manipulate who's interacting with whom in a way that might give rise to properties you might care about or suppress other properties you wish to suppress. A second possibility is that you say, look, it's very difficult in real life to force people to be friends or I can't force you guys to get a divorce or force you guys to get married. You know, I can't just go around and engineer social interactions. I'll accept the social interactions I observe in the world and instead I'm gonna manipulate contagion which tries to change the flows through the graph. Here an intuitive model might be something like a bioterrorist. Who would you infect if you were a bioterrorist? You would infect the most central person in the graph. That would cause the, most, the biggest epidemic to occur rather than, let's say, a peripheral person. And a third and more subtle and very recent thing we've been tackling, and here I'll introduce you to some of the work we've been doing with artificial intelligence recently, is what we call position interventions, which is how you change the location here the idea is, is you have a given structure and you have an ensemble of individuals. Where should those people be put in this structure to maximize collective benefit? A simple metaphor for this might be a seating chart in, a, in an office or in a classroom. The teacher has the chairs and desks, they're nailed to the floor in particular locations, and he or she has a group of students of differing abilities that need to be assigned seats. Where should the students be seated to maximize learning in the classroom? Same seating arrangement, same students, different locations within the seating chart could lead to different outcomes at the collective level according to how you position the people. And I'll show you an example of that in just a moment. 
Now, to do this work, we've invented some software, which we call Breadboard. This is publicly available for non-commercial use. This software uh, allows you to create temporary artificial societies of real people on our lab. We've had over 20,000 people have come and used this software in our laboratory, used the, uh, had the experience in our lab of, play, of participating in these experiments. It's integrated with Amazon Mechanical Turk, so you can seamlessly recruit thousands of people to do these experimental games. But it can also be used in firms and in schools and in other kinds of uh, location. This gives us a kind of godlike control over the social system. So we say, well, what if, the topolo what if the network's the structure matters? Or what if the information asymmetry matters? Or what if the payoff matrices matter? Uh, we can experimentally manipulate those, recruit subjects, hundreds or thousands of them, drop them into our experiment, and conduct uh, the experiment to test our ideas. We've done many experiments like this. I'm just going to show you uh, two of them that relate to manipulating connection. In this experiment, uh, nearly 1,000 people were brought into the lab, into the online laboratory, and they were dropped into a network that's shown in the lower left here. This is a, a, a simulation of a real network structure, it's something known as an urgus Reni random graph with 30 percent tie saturation. It doesn't matter. It looks like a real network of people. And each person is assigned a location within the network and introduced to their neighbors, their new neighbors. And they're given some real money, and they're told that they're going to play a public goods game, like I introduced a moment ago, with their neighbors. And in the beginning, most of the people start by being nice and cooperative and making a donation to their neighbors. Those are the blue dots. The mean defectors who take advantage of their neighbors are the red dots. So here at the beginning on the first panel, uh, in, in the fixed network shown in the lower uh, row of uh, networks, you have about 65% of the people are blue dots at the beginning. And then they play multiple rounds of the game again and again and again. And what happens is if I drop you into one of these networks and introduce you to your friends and you say, oh, I'll be nice to my neighbors, and then they take advantage of you, kind of like those high school projects we all hated when you were assigned a group and everyone else is lazy and you don't want to do all the work, so you say, OK, I'm going to be lazy too. So everyone is taking advantage of you, so you have no choice. But also, why should you be the fool that keeps contributing to the public good? You stop contributing as well. So in this branch of the experiment, in a fixed network, Cooperation disappears from the system, and everyone becomes a defector. Except these few little blue cooperators sort of on the edge of the network here, keeping civilization alive, you know, kind of cooperate on the margins of the graph uh, and sticking together. So this is what happens in a fixed graph. In a different branch of the experiment, we manipulated the rules of connection. In that branch of the experiment, shown in the upper part, we allowed each person at every time step, in addition to choosing whether to cooperate or defect, we also allowed them to choose whether to cut some of the ties or keep some of the ties to their neighbors. So they could form connections with other people or cut connections with other people in certain ways. And what we found in that branch of the experiment is that cooperation persists. There's actually a lot more going on in this experiment, but the gist of the experiment is the following thing. I can take you people and connect you according to one set of rules and you're mean sons of bitches to each other. Or I could take you people and connect you by a different set of rules, and you're really sweet and kind to each other. So it's the same people, different topological rules, different architecture yields different emergent properties of the system. Now, in another experiment that we published a couple of years ago in Nature, in this experiment, we became very interested in uh, economic inequality. And there's been a lot of interest in how economic inequality is affecting our society. We're at century high levels of inequality in the developed world in the United States. Our, our Gini coefficient is now about 0.4, which is at the level of Morocco, for example. Uh, Scandinavian countries are around 0.2. Um, so we have very high levels of inequality at a century long high. And people have gone out and looked at this and, and tried to make inferences about how the inequality is affecting our social fabric, or our economic productivity, or our health. But always those studies are observational. So we decided to use our system to do some experiments to create virtual societies of real people in which we experimentally manipulated the level of inequality and randomly assigned people to be rich or poor. And this shows some of those results of this experiment. Now, in addition, one of the things we did in this experiment is, is we manipulated how unequal the worlds into which the people were dropped were, but we also manipulated as an independent attribute whether the wealth was visible or not. Everyone knew their own wealth, but in some worlds, they could see their neighbor's wealth, their immediate neighbors, and in other worlds, they could not see their neighbor's wealth, exploiting some ideas about visibility of display that are also have a quite old provenance in the social sciences. So in this experiment, in the invisible condition, in the far left, 
Here's the starting situation for these people. They're dropped into a network. The dot size is proportional to how much money they have, how rich they are. The letter inside indicates whether they were rich R or P poor, to which they were randomly assigned at the beginning. And the dot color follows our standard convention of red dots are defectors and blue dots are cooperators. And they play multiple rounds of the game, a public goods game again with their neighbors. So here you see the world starts with a very high inequality, 0.4. And in the invisible condition, by the end of the game, the Gini has gone way down. We have a very equal world. Wealth is very equally distributed. It's now 0.14. All the dots are big and rich, nice and fat and rich. And most of them are cooperative. They're mostly blue. That's what happens in the invisible condition. In a different branch of the experiment, we flipped a switch. And now we made people able to see each other's wealth in the visible condition. And there you get none of those desirable outcomes. Inequality stays high. There's a lot of much less wealth is produced. And many more people are red or are defectors. In fact, these results sort of broke my left wing heart because I was convinced that inequality would be very corrosive for the societies, but that's not at all what we found. We actually found that the inequality didn't matter very much at all. What really mattered was the visibility, was the ability to see other people's wealth. So for example, here on the x-axis is the rounds of the game, and on the y-axis is the average wealth produced in these societies, and these are the six different branches of the experiment or the treatments. The colors indicate how much inequality there was at the beginning that they were randomly assigned, Blue is no inequality, red is low inequality, uh, yellow is high inequality, and the dottedness of the line indicates whether the wealth of your neighbors was visible or not. And the punchline of this slide is that the inequality lines are very clustered together. They didn't have much of a different impact, but the visibility mattered a lot. And the societies in which people were, could not see their neighbor's wealth were able to produce much more visibility, uh, much more wealth. And similarly, those societies were also more cooperative. Same as before, but now on the y-axis is the proportion of cooperators across time. So these results are very similar to the kinds of things you might think about. A metaphor might be a school uniform policy. I always used to oppose school uniform policies because I thought they were like fascistic and who, you know, it's, I wanted people to express their individuality. But if you think about a school uniform, a school uniform is like an invisibility cloak, right? It makes it impossible to have different uh, displays of wealth asymmetry, maybe increasing learning and increasing cooperation in the classroom by analogy to the experiment I just told you. Those are a couple of connection interventions. Let me show you a contagion intervention, then I'll close with a position intervention and a last uh, final idea. We've begun to be, uh, we've been doing manipu uh, contagion manipulations over the last 10 years or so in a variety of parts uh, around the world. We, we work mostly in developing world villages, but the technology and the ideas that we invent and test are broadly applicable to many situations, including commercial applications. But let me introduce this idea with a public health example, which is what we do. Imagine you have two villages, and you map the networks, who's connected to who, who's friends with who in these two villages. On the left, you have the control village, which gets no treatment. And on the right, you have the treated village in which six people are chosen at random to get a public health intervention about breastfeeding or clean water, for example. And those six people are highlighted in yellow. And the ordinary perspective in public health is you deliver the intervention to those six people or the marketing effort if you're selling a product. And you come back a year later and you measure what fraction of those people responded to the intervention. Perhaps three of the six will have adopted the practice. 50% you'll say great. But that's not what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in response to treatment among the treated. I'm interested in response to treatment among the untreated. I want to know what does everyone else in the village do when you give those six people the intervention. Maybe three of the six respond, and they recruit three of their friends, a total of six people in the treated village on the right. And in the control village on the left, maybe just by secular change, two people adopt the product. You should already, and that difference between six and two tells you the measure of the spillover effect of your treatment. But you should already be forming the opinion, why should I uh, target people at random? Maybe, for instance, I should pick six central people using the mathematics of network science, compute who's central in the network, and give them the intervention. Maybe under this choice, once again, three of the six yellow dots respond to the treatment, and they recruit 30 of their friends adopt. Same village, same treatment, same public health intervention given to them. Same number of people treated, 10 times the effect, because you've now shrewdly and, and effectively targeted structurally influential individuals. So what we're interested in here is not who you are 
but where you are in the network. Identifying people on the basis of not their own attributes, but because of their structural position within the graph, delivering an intervention to them with the expectation that it'll spill out and maybe dramatically increase the return on investment for your marketing effort by not only changing the behavior of the targets, but of everyone else around them. Now, we've done many experiments of this, showing that this can be done in online and offline settings. One of the places where we work, have worked the most is in Honduras. This is a very poor part of the world. People here live on about $2 a day. Uh, this is a coffee growing region. Uh, there are little small villages, little hamlets that are in this sort of hilly part of the world. I, these villages have 100 or 200 or 500 or let's say 1,000 people. I was giving a talk about this work in China a couple years ago and they said, oh, we'd love to take you to one of our small villages. I said, that's great. And there were half a million people in that village. So these are truly small villages. These are just, you know, a couple of hundred people. And we wrote some other software, which we call Trellis, which is also available for non-commercial use. This is battle-hardened, tablet-based software that allows you to go into the field or into a church or into a workplace or into a school or into a factory and map the networks very rapidly of the people in this uh, community. So we mapped the networks in this initial project. Uh, there were 5,000 people in the initial project uh, in 32 villages. And then we randomly assigned the villages to always get the same intervention, but we exploited or we randomly assigned them to different targeting algorithms. So in, in one third of the villages, 5% of the people were chosen at random. In another third of the villages, 5% were chosen who had the highest degree, the people with the most connections, which I introduced a while ago. And in a third third of the villages, 5% were chosen according to a different targeting algorithm that we believe should be very uh, effective. And this illustrates how the targets might vary in one hypothetical village. This is a real village, a real social connections. And then I show you who are the 5% shown in orange that would have been picked if they were chosen at random. And the yellow dot shows who are the 5% that would have been picked if you picked the people with the highest degree. And you should see that the yellow dots are moving to the center of the network. They have a different structural position than the orange dots, which are spread out. And what we were able to show in this experiment, which was published in The Lancet a couple of years ago, on the x-axis is the days since initial targeting, so this is like product adoption, and on the y-axis is the redemption of these multivitamin, uh, uh, taking possession of a multivitamin uh, intervention that we had offered them. And these show the adoption, and we showed that actually we could get 75% of the people to uh, uh, take up vitamins uh, within two weeks using the nomination targeting algorithm. One of our two algorithms outperformed the other algorithms. Now, we're following up this study uh, with support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We have a massive grant. We are mapping the social networks of 30,000 people in 176 villages. I think it's the largest ever face-to-face -face mapping project in very demanding field conditions. And we're randomly assigning these 176 villages to, to different targeting algorithms to test not the efficacy of the intervention, but to test, can we create artificial tipping points? Are there ways in which, by thoughtfully choosing who is structurally influential, can we drive adoption and change public health practices for the better in these communities? This slide summarizes our results. I'm not gonna go much into what's on the left here. Just quickly say that there are 176 villages, 30,000 people, we've already mapped the networks, we've collected the baseline data, we're in partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank that's delivering the intervention and the Ministry of Health in Honduras that's delivering the intervention. And we have a, something known as an eight by two factorial design. We are manipulating two different things, the fraction of the people in each village that gets the public health intervention and the way those individuals are chosen at random or according to this other algorithm, nom the nomination algorithm. And uh, what re what, remember, what we're measuring is the adoption of everyone in the village, not just the people that are offered the intervention. And this slide shows some hypothetical results on the right-hand side. What you can see is that on the x-axis is the percent targeted, the fraction of people that are given the intervention, which is experimentally manipulated, and on the y-axis is the percent reach, the percent that adopt the product, which doesn't top off at 100%. It only tops off at 50% because, of course, not everyone will adopt a product or not everyone will become infected with a pathogen if a pathogen is spreading. Now, ordinarily, you, when you think of no social effect, that's shown in the purple line, you target 100% of the people, maybe 50% adopt, or 60% of the people and 30% adopt. That's a linear response curve when there's no social effect. But everyone in this audience knows that that's typically not how marketing works. Typically what happens is you get an S-shaped diffusion of innovation curve, which is shown in the dotted red line. 
So at the beginning, even though you're selling your product to 20 or 30% of the people, nobody is adopting. Why? Because their friends aren't adopting. So the social effect works against you and makes the adoption sublinear. It pushes it down. And then you get the epidemic growth phase, the explosive growth, the inflection point, when you reach the critical point, and then all of a sudden, bang, it explodes. And now the social effect works with you and reinforces your product till it plateaus at some point where no longer can you recruit any customers or any susceptible uh, individuals to the pathogen. What we want to see is can we shift that curve to the left? Can we enhance the social effect by thoughtful and shrewd selection? Can we find the right 20% of the people to select such that if you give them the intervention, it's as effective as if you gave, let's say, 100% of the people the intervention? So those are some contagion examples. Let me now show you some of our most recent work. This was published a year ago in Nature in, uh, in 2017, and uh, which involves some of our work with position interventions and artificial intelligence. Uh, and then I'll close with some final, uh, one final idea. So in this experiment, what we wanted to begin to explore was a number of ideas. Uh, we wanted to look at uh, how groups might be uh, better organized or could we take advantage of an understanding of the position of individuals within groups and some bot technology that we had invented to affect the performance of individuals and of groups. So in this experiment, people, 4,000 people were recruited with our, in our platform, 4,000 individuals, and dropped into 230 unique groups. And they were dropped into the network, and they were given now something known as a color coordination task. So everyone is assigned a location in the network. There are three colors they can pick from, orange, yellow, or purple. And they are told that they have to pick a color dissimilar from their neighbors. They can only see their neighbor's colors and their own color. And if they all work together and coordinate their efforts, and the group solves the problem, which is that everyone has a color different than their neighbors, they will be paid. The whole group gets paid. But if they're unable to coordinate and work together, nobody gets paid. So the group is incentivized to work together to only with local knowledge, each person only sees the immediate people around them, to reach a global solution where the uh, group performance has been optimized. So you drop the people in the network, and like you, they would do what anyone would do. They look at their neighbors. They pick a color that minimizes conflicts with their neighbors. Every second or two, pick, ping, ping, they're flipping colors or flipping colors. So this shows what happens in the game in one run of the game. On the, uh, the game's last five minutes, 300 seconds, here's time on the x-axis for this one game. Uh, here's number of color conflicts. The red lines indicate two people are in conflict with each other. The purple lines indicate that they're not in conflict. For instance, this orange dot in the upper left is not in conflict with this yellow dot, but is in conflict with this other orange dot. Therefore, if this orange dot on the far left switches to purple, they will eliminate the conflicts. That's a good move for that dot to make. So if people start making changes in their colors, they start making changes in their colors. There are two different kinds of conflicts they can have, something called resolvable conflicts and unresolvable conflicts. I won't go into that right now. But to make the long story short, right around 105 seconds, the group almost solves the problem. There's only one conflict left. And the problem now is that neither of these two yellow dots can make a move to help out. Because if they switch to orange or purple, they'll increase the conflicts with their neighbors. So they're just stuck now. The group is stuck. One of these people has to do something counterintuitive and make a choice that increases the conflicts with their neighbors. So they have more color conflicts. In fact, that's what happens. This guy switches to purple. And eventually, the group is able to solve the problem. And by 245 seconds, they've solved the problem, and they get paid. Now, because we're sneaky, we did this experiment, some runs, where we surreptitiously replaced three of the humans with bots. And we programmed the bots to behave in very specific ways with an intention of increasing the ability of groups to work together. Let me explain some of those results to you and the broader implications from those results. Here we show on the, uh, the x-axis is time, again, up to five minutes. And on the y-axis is the probability that the group has not solved the game. So for instance, if you look at this panel here, at the very beginning, 100% of the groups have not solved the game. And as time goes by, more and more of the groups have solved the game. The orange lines show the control treatment with just humans. So right here in the middle panel, at the beginning, 100% of the human groups have not solved the game. And then as time goes by, more and more human groups have solved the game, so that by the end, 65% of the human groups have solved the game, and a third of them have not. Now, we experimentally manipulated bot placement in other hundreds of groups. 
Were we manipulated? Were the bots dropped randomly? Were they dropped into the center? Or were they dropped into the periphery of the network, defined along the way I introduced you at the beginning of this talk? And we furthermore manipulated something else, which is how error-prone were the bots? Did we make the bots perfect? That is to say, they had 0% noise. At every time step, they looked at their neighbors and said, what's the color conflict, the color I can pick that has the least conflicts with my neighbors? That's what I'll pick, a kind of very rational choice. Or did we say, sometimes do something crazy, like a crazy Ivan strategy. Pick a color that increases the uh, conflicts with your neighbors 10% of the time, or a lot of noise, 30% of the time, make a counterintuitive choice and increase conflict with your neighbors. And what we were able to show is that slightly noisy bots, if put in the middle of the network, substantially improve the performance of these human groups. That a little error, a little counterintuitive thinking among some individuals in a group enhances the performance of the group. And in fact, we're beginning to explore all kinds of simple and complex programming, what we call social artificial intelligence, that might make these bots more effective. So what I'm interested in in my lab is not AlphaGo or IBM Watson. I'm not interested in developing super smart AI to replace human cognition. I'm interested in inventing dumb AI to supplement human interaction. And because this dumb AI is dropped in among smart humans, the AI doesn't need to be smart at all. It just needs to overcome the activation energy. It just needs to help the humans to help themselves, lubricate a little bit, address, help the humans address collective action problems. We believe these bots which we are inventing can be used to change collective behavior, not just in coordination like this, but when it comes to other collective action problems like cooperation, evacuation, navigation, sharing, and, all, and the spread of fake news, for instance, and all kinds of dilemmas like that. In addition, something I didn't tell you is that these bots not only make the task of the humans to whom they are connected easier, the bots have ripple effects in the network. They also change the gameplay of the humans who are connected to other humans. So these bots help the humans to help themselves. Think about this idea. Everyone's very concerned. I mean, like right now, we have just human-driven cars on the highway. And in 20 years, they'll be virtually all Auto, you know, uh, na uh, uh, driverless cars, there'll be, you know, uh, autonomous vehicles will be driving on the highway. But in between the two periods, we're gonna have what I call a hybrid system, a system that is composed of both humans and machines living on the same plane. So on our streets, we'll have a hybrid system of humans and machines. And the question is, not necessarily, how should the robotic vehicles be programmed so as to maximize the safety of the robotic vehicle inhabitants, but how should the robotic vehicles be programmed so as to change the behavior of all the human drivers on the highway. Maybe, in fact, there's a way we can optimize the programming of these vehicles such that they don't only drive safely, but they eliminate traffic jams and eliminate traffic accidents by causing ripple effects among the human drivers. And one, key, one tiny idea about how they might do that is actually that they should not be too perfect. If the car in front of you is a robotic car and it's driving exactly the same speed and direction at all times, you might be lulled into a false sense of security and not pay attention like you would if a human driver was occasionally a little bit erratic. Now, that's not a problem if every car is a robotic car. They can move in lockstep with each other. But if some are and some are not, you might want actually to equip your robotic car with a little bit of error, a little bit of lane changing, a little bit of acceleration and deceleration to keep the other humans on their toes. Okay, I want to close with one final idea having to do with what it means when we intervene in a social network. Because I think such networks provide us with a way to manipulate what's known as social capital. And to understand this, consider this idea. What's the point of a connected life? How does it help us as individuals and as a species? And it turns out that networks are a resource that we can all use. Networks are a kind of social capital. Now, most people, when they think about capital, think about money. But really, capital is any stock of resources that can be put to productive use. So capital is a stock that you can produce something with, that you can do something with. And two further key ideas about capital are that in order to create capital, you have to invest skill and effort. You have to know something and do something in order to create capital. And second, and more subtle, and in an idea that's been keeping me awake for 20 years, I've been thinking about this, is that in order to create capital, you have to make changes in a substance that make it yield a higher rate of return than it otherwise would. 
that actually at, a, at its deepest core, the capital creation process is about the transformation of the natural world from one thing into another thing, which is what endows the second object with this productive power and makes it a reservoir of wealth. What do I mean by that? Imagine you, take, you have this forest, and you invest skill and effort, and you convert the forest into a farm. And the farm is more valuable than the forest because you can do things with a farm that you couldn't do with a forest, namely grow fruits and grains and vegetables, for example. So you invest skill and effort, you transform the land from one thing into another thing, and that makes it a reservoir of wealth and a stock of productive power. Or imagine you have this tree, and you take this tree and you invest skill and effort and you, and you mill it into lumber. And the lumber is more valuable than the tree because you can do things with the lumber that you couldn't do with the tree. Namely, invest still more skill and effort and make a violin. And the violin is more valuable than the lumber because you can do things with the violin you couldn't do with the lumber. Namely, make music. So at each step of the way, you transform the natural world, convert one thing to another, endow it with productive power, and make it a reservoir of wealth. Now, in the 1960s, social scientists began to think about human beings this way. So you can take this dissolute former graduate student of mine on the far left, who's a drunkard, and you can invest skill and effort and clean him up and transform him into someone who's more capable of doing things he wasn't previously able to do, such as invest still more skill and effort and give him an education. This is how we think of human capital. So right now, I'm investing skill and effort, and I'm working on the neurons of your brains. I'm transforming your minds, and hopefully, I'm making you capable of doing things you were not previously able to do. Well, just like physical capital is created by a change in the material world and human capital by a change in persons, social capital in organizations, in villages, in companies, in communities, in schools, in factories, in fact, in our whole society, is a change in the relations among persons, a change that renders the group more productive and capable of doing things it was not previously able to do. And that's the deepest account I can give you of what social networks mean for our lives and how and why it is that we can use them to make our world better. Thank you. <laughs>